That was certainly one of the most uh, interesting openings to a workshop um, <laughs> I've seen in a while. We might have to reevaluate the SOP on workshops. That, uh, <laughs> the other, the other um, significance of Fiddler and Roof was that um, the message was that life was precarious and then you never knew when you were going to fall off the roof, when the fiddler would fall off the roof. So in that sense, I certainly do feel like a fiddler on the roof in Washington right now <laughs> as a political appointee. I want, to, um, I want to thank you for having me here today. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share with you some, some of the efforts that FDA is pursuing to expand opportunities when we to use real world data in support of our decision making. I also want to thank the National Academies who organized today's workshop and a special thanks goes to uh, Greg Simon and the members of the planning committee and especially my colleagues at FDA. I also want to recognize um, Commissioner Rob Califf who's here today who championed these ideas as commissioner both before and after his tenure but certainly during his tenure at FDA and we would not be here with this to have this discussion today if not for his leadership efforts as well as Dr. Dr. McClellan, who's also here today, um, who's continued to champion these ideas um, from his current role at uh, the Duke Margolis Center. So I want to give a special thanks to both of them. They've both been very important to my work. Today's workshop is part of a collaborative effort between FDA and the National Academies to help develop methods for collecting and evaluating real world evidence in ways that can support FDA's work. We've been talking about RWE for a number of years now, but I want to tell you why RWE matters to me. The more widespread use of real world evidence can make our medical product development process more efficient and help lower the cost of development. And more importantly, it can help make sure doctors and patients have, are better informed about the clinical use of new products, enabling them to make more effective, efficient medical choices. And this will ultimately help us achieve better outcomes and safer and more efficient use of new technology. But there's uncertainty among sponsors about the role of real world evidence and the role it plays in regulatory decisions. And FDA's interest in advancing the adoption of RWE in support of its program remains a top priority. And it's a high priority of mine. We need to close the evidence gap between the information we use to make FDA's decisions and the evidence increasingly used by the medical community, by payers, and by other char others charged with making healthcare decisions. Real world evidence is becoming especially prominent as a way to make decisions on coverage and reimbursement. As the payer community makes more widespread use of these constructs, the rigor by which RWE is being collected is also gaining more precision. We're seeing the advent of more rigorous clinical registries. We're seeing electronic medical records being used in more effective ways to collect information at the point of care. As the breadth and reliability of RWE increases, so do the opportunities for FDA to also make use of this information. The hierarchy of evidence is evolving as a consequence. This is the hierarchy that has long defined the reliability of clinical evidence and puts the randomized prospective placebo-controlled trial at the top of that pyramid. This pyramid has remained unchanged, even as our tools for collecting practical data have advanced even as the constructs that fall underneath the fully randomized prospective placebo-controlled trial are expanding and their usefulness for informing our decisions are becoming more apparent. And even as the reliability of other forms of evidence is increasing, as the methodologies for evaluating different forms of data continue to include, improve, and this includes RWA. At FDA, we need to plan carefully for how we can leverage these new constructs as a way to better inform our work. This starts by adapting how we see our role in this information matrix, including how people can talk about the results based on these evidentiary standards. FDA needs to think of itself as a curator of information and not just an arbiter, where a single truth standard is secured to a fixed orthodoxy. The latter concept is increasingly at odds with the way decisions are being made by others who depend on reliable evidence to guide their paths, including doctors and health plans. FDA is an important independent evaluator of this information. Given our function and the significant role it plays in public health promotion, we want to support the development of and access to appropriate forms of reliable evidence that meet our standard for approval. The fact is there's often no single truth standard when it comes to evidence used to support medical decisions. Clinical choices are made all the time based on a mosaic of information of various precision and certainty. That continuum includes real world evidence as well as the facts gleaned from rigorous and carefully fashioned trials and a lot of evidence constructs in between. The question for FDA is this, how do we make room for the wealth of evidence that can better inform our decisions 
evidence that's becoming more available and more reliable. How do we fit RWE into our regulatory hierarchy? To address these questions and advance the use of real-world evidence across our pre- and post-market medical review process, we'll be publishing consensus definitions that relate to how different parts of FDA use this information as one component of our regulatory decisions. Among other things, we'll be including a detailed description of RWE and its potential applications for satisfying aspects of FDA's pre- and post-market requirements as part of a guidance document we're developing. As we consider these efforts to make wider use of RWE, our abiding faith will remain one thing above all else, strengthening and advancing FDA's gold standard for regulatory decision making. But make no, make no mistake, there's nothing in our statute or regulations that prevent FDA from using a broad range of informative sources of evidence. On the contrary, many of our statutory responsibilities boil down to one principal calculus, what do we know and how do we balance benefits and risks based on the fullest possible information? This construct already exists in FDA statute. There's nothing novel about this approach. FDA routinely draws inferences on how medical products behave on the basis of practical data. On the evaluation of safety, FDA regularly relies on real world evidence to make decisions. This is also spelled out in our guidance on the evaluation of emerging risks. Our public health mandate drives us to look at all possible data sources to better inform our decisions. FDA has wide latitude to use evidence based on substantial clinical experience in appropriate circumstances. For those who challenge the suitability of our effort to incorporate real world evidence into our regulatory model, I challenge you with the opposite intention. Should a product be marketed based on a data set that speaks to a limited and rigidly constructed circumstance, when the clinical use, and in turn the evidence we might have to evaluate the product, could have been far richer, far more diverse, and far more informative. The pre- and post-market evaluation of medical products is not a binary line. It's part of a continuum. No product is all risky and uncertain one day, and completely safe and effective the next. It's true that we often need a clear standard and line of demarcation as a way to make decisions as a regulatory agency. This is especially true when one views the medical product approval process. But we have a broader mandate as a public health agency to engage in the life cycle of how products are used. That means embracing the full continuum of evidence that informs their clinical use. We see this approach gaining more rapid and widespread acceptance when it comes to some medical products. But we need to continue to more widely advance this life cycle concept of regulation. We can't allow our need for a point of regulatory accountability to prevent us from looking across the line we have to draw at practical information that's collected both before and after our point of demarcation when a product gains a license for initial market entry. That's why the discussion of RWE is illuminating. It forces us to confront certain realities. This kind of evidence can make our regulatory obligations better informed about the true, risk, the true benefit risk profile of a medical product, as well as provide earlier identification and a richer understanding of safety concerns. At FDA, many groups already use RWA to make decisions, including regulatory decisions on risks and benefits. <laughs> to, enable in, to enable greater adoption of RWA in clinical and regulatory decisions, we'll need to work with he the healthcare system to change the way clinical information is collected. Ideally, we'd like to have a system where providers have the right incentives to enter clinically relevant inf information into EMRs at the point of care but a lot of the incentives force data to be structured in ways that are geared to billing. Clinically relevant information that can tell us what's happening to patients often remains in an unstructured note format. We're unable to learn as much as we could about a product's profile when that information isn't accessible. We also need to find a better way to collect information directly from patients because an EMR and claims data is really patient's perspective filtered through the provider. FDA also needs to do its part to advance the use of RWE. I recognize that FDA isn't always clear about our approach to RWE and regulatory decisions. So how innovators incorporate these concepts into medical product development is also likely to falter. Knowing this, FDA is taking steps to provide more clarity. Last month, we issued final guidance on the use of RWE in the development of devices. Since early 2015 alone, we've approved or cleared more than eight new medical devices and expanded the use of more than six technologies based on evidence derived from RWD. This includes drug-eluting stents, 
transcatheter heart valves and technologies for spinal cord stimulation and esophageal atresia, as well as IVDs. These, in these cases, we're using robust evidence that was generated in less time and at a lower cost than in the past, in some cases saving one or two years of development time. Increasingly, medical device makers are also meeting their post-market study requirements by leveraging real-world evidence sources. These approaches allow for more rapid data collection. It increases the likelihood that the evidence will be generated because it's already being gathered as part of routine clinical practice. We're now working on policies to support the use of RWE and the approval of new indications for already marketed drugs. This may be especially relevant in settings like rare diseases or unmet medical needs where it can be hard to enroll patients in clinical trials. We're also expanding policies to enable the use of RWE to support post-approval post drug study requirements. But we must also be realistic about current limitations. Even if we made progress on the challenges, RWE won't replace data from traditional clinical data in many cases. But we can achieve more opportunity in the pre- and post-market context to use RWE in the settings where doing so will improve overall medical product development. During today's workshop and in years ahead, I want you to know that FDA will support your work on these efforts. At FDA, we intend to expand our regulatory policy development work on achieving the more appropriate adoption of RWE as part of the entire life cycle approach to medical product development. We can't do it alone. Your collaboration on these efforts is going to be critical to our success. Thanks a lot. What kinds of questions? Um, yeah, I'll just start with a softball, Scott. Uh, you know, what I'm seeing now that I'm liberated again is um, a, lot of concern, <laughs> a lot of concern by um, industry in particular about um, the sort of system of data verification and audit and checking that goes on that if they don't continue the very expensive nurses on airplanes routine and all that, that um, they'll get to the end of the day and someone at FDA will say your work is not adequate. So I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about how to address that. It'll be a topic for the rest of the meeting, but I know you've thought about this a lot. I, I notice you're liberated on Twitter also now. <laughs> <laughs> When, when, when Dr. Califf was uh, at, at FDA, the lawyers wouldn't let him tweet. When I got to FDA, the lawyers wouldn't let me tweet, but I decided not to take legal advice on that matter. <laughs> you should have consulted me. Um, you know, it's a good question. Um, and we, we've, you've, I know you've had a lot of discussions inside the agency about this, so you ha probably have a perspective on what the view is. I think that there is there's a emerging view that as more of this data is gathered electronically, more of the audits are going to be able to be done um, you know, with, with um, digital tools that will be more efficient and allow uh, FDA to gain the certainty it needs without some of the maybe perhaps more costly and cumbersome um, time-intensive processes that they've used in the past to try to evaluate the veracity of data that came into the agency. So I think, I think as we sort of march into an environment where more of this data is being collected on EMRs, um, where there's more opportunity for electronic audits of, um, of both the data collection and, and the integrity of the data, you know, including you, you talk to people at the agency, they're looking at things like the use of AI to try to evaluate um, you know, things like missing data or, or where, where data coming into the agency um, might be um, nonsensical that could indicate that it wasn't appropriately collected. Um, those kinds of tools, I think, are going to become more and more prominent, more and more of a feature of, of this kind of work. I think that's probably your, been your experience as well when you've, when you've talked to folks. <laughs> so first I'd like to point out, I've been told I can't tweet by my current boss, but I have a question for my... <laughs> my former boss, which given the, the amount of time and energy and effort you put into this while you were at FDA and now with your full understanding of FDA and all its strengths and limitations, what advice would you have for Scott and those of us on his team in terms of helping this move forward? 
I just want to start by saying I've never taken away the speech rights of any of, this, <laughs> any of the uh, senior executives at FDA. Rachel, Rachel's allowed to tweet. She just has to demonstrate she can text to the right person first. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, the, the story is correct. I was told I couldn't tweet. I obeyed orders. And I noticed Andy Slavitt was tweeting. I mean, he's gone completely crazy in tweeting since. <laughs> but he was quit tweeting while he was at CMS. And I never asked him, which was a mistake. Because when I did ask him, why did you get to tweet and I didn't, he said, I was told I couldn't. I just did it anyway. So, <laughs> and then he said there was an entire team at the White House that was assigned to uh, clean up behind his tweets. So. Maybe it was not a good resource use, I don't know. But um, in terms of advice for the FDA, I uh, think there's an extraordinary um, amount of regulatory inertia right now. Uh, Rich sitting next to me said, you know, how many real world evidence meetings can you have? And I, I think the hope is, is we, if we have enough meetings, things will happen. But um, I think the FDA needs to take some very proactive steps to break the logjam that currently exists. Um, there will be some risk involved because of the audit issue, but if people are so af afraid that they'd rather invest huge amounts of money and not answer most, as we'll get into, not answer most of the questions that patients care about, um, you know, we'll be stuck for a while longer. So. Um, rather than just saying it's okay to do it, my main advice would be to actually develop some pilot programs and incentivize some people to go ahead and um, get going with this because I, th I think we really need it. Other than that, I mean, I, you know, I think people know I'm retweeting almost everything Scott tweets because I think you're on the right track. I think the um, direction that you're headed is uh, really good and I'm uh, happy to see it from the outside. Thank you, Dr. Kaleer. I'll just make one, one sort of follow-up observation. I think if you look at what's happening at FDA right now, you see um, pretty robust adoption of these constructs on the medical device side of FDA's house. And you know, it, it, the, the adoption of RWE in the context of medical device regulation um, probably makes more immediate sense because medical devices are iterative, so, so there's a, a natural re requirement to sort of learn about the products over the life cycle, the forms of the products. And medical devices also are closer to the, the application of a medical device is also closer to, to the end user who also would be the one collecting the information, the physician. The physician uses the medical device, the physician's in a position to collect information as, about the medical device, as opposed to drugs, which are often taken by individuals, sometimes not under close supervision of a physician, so there's not as much opportunity to capture that data. So there is sort of a, this natural, um, more natural um, construct on the medical device side with these kinds of approaches I think would, would fit into the paradigm. But, but that's, that's actually a good thing, because the way the agency evolves, if you look at it historically, is a, a new concept like this will gain traction in one element of the agency's regulatory portfolio and then migrate out into other parts of the, the agency. I think you're seeing that happen also with RWE, where CDRH just finalized the guidance on the use of RWE um, in the context of medical device trials, including for pre- and post-market studies. And now you're going to see um, some of the standards and some of the, the language that, that was used in de developing that guidance document, as well as the definitions, start to migrate into other contexts. I think that there are some natural, more natural barriers, if you will, on the medical, on the, uh, on the drug side, where, where it doesn't fit as directly into sort of the continuum of how drugs are regulated. But, but I still think that there's a, obviously a very robust role for, for RWE to be used in the drug side. And I think you're going to see it migrate across the agency. And that's the, that's part of the work that, that Dr. Sherman's heading up in her group, her medical policy group that she's constituted within the office of the principal deputy um, to try to bring more uh, cross-center collaboration around uh, these kinds of cross-center concepts. I, I wanted to ask if you could, uh, two, two of the, to circle back around to two of the comments you made, one of those being about the disconnect between the kind of data we record in the more traditional clinical research environment and that in the clinical practice environment and the disconnect between those. But then also the idea of, of both of these uh, ways of recording data as, as being ways of, of digesting and, and sometimes altering the patient's actual experience. Um, you know, in both cases we say, 
either a practicing clinician or a researcher must somehow hear a patient's experience translated into some different language and record it as if some direct reporting of the patient's experience will give us the wrong answer. I'm, 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 being, I'm you know, pushing that, that point a little bit, I guess. But I'm, I'm interested in, in your thoughts about that because most, in most every other industry, we're cutting out middlemen and we're cutting out information mediators and we're saying, can we get the true consumer, the person we're trying to serve, to speak as directly to them as we can about what they experience and what they want? So, so my question, going back around to the metaphor I used earlier is, are these processes, these, these middle people mediating the patients, between the patient's experience and some sort of recording, are, are these valuable traditions or are these just anchors which are slowing things down? I think with respect to, to um, clinical practice and the evidence that gets generated in, in clinical practice, I made the comment that's more geared towards billing than, than clinical use in, in the way that we would conceive it uh, for purposes of collecting RWE. And I, I think that that's true. If you look at the structure of an EMR in terms of how information gets inputted, and a lot of the, a lot of the queries are geared towards the, uh, the billing requirements. Uh, we tried to address this. I was on the committee that tried to address some of this through the meaningful use standards. I don't think that we, we fully um, addressed this and tried to orient some of the clinical data collection in the EMRs towards things that would be more clinically relevant for purposes of trying to develop information for, for RWE. There's a sort of general refrain that the Europeans have a better system than us, and they might have a better approach with respect to the interoperability of, of their um, clinical data collection systems. But when you look at what's being collected, I don't think it's much different than the experience here in the US. Uh, maybe they're their unstructured notes are a little less cluttered uh, because they don't have some of the same uh, impediments in terms of doctors doing things for um, defensive purposes and sometimes that uh, making it harder to interpret what the, what the true clinical uh, um, reasoning was. But, uh, but I think that the Europeans have the same challenges with a lot of the inputs being more geared towards billing and not clinical use and so it makes it hard to derive the information right now from um, from the EMRs, a lot of the relevant information that we'd want to derive is in a very unstructured format. As far as the patients are concerned, and the whole issue of the the physician being a filter between the patient and the and the um, collection of the relevant data, I, I think that there is an element of that. I think we've we've tried to advance the use of PROs, patient reported outcomes, and other tools. Those are still oftentimes collected by physicians as an intermediary. But I think we're, gonna, we're seeing the advent of more and more technology that's gathering data in a way that's very direct from the patient. So you, know, you can conceive very shortly of a world where instead of a you know, five or 10 minute walk test for, for a drug that's a value, that is trying to impact the physical ability of a patient, um, a, some kind of biometric device that the patient wears might give a much better uh, evaluation of, of physical activity of someone over the course of time with the application of a therapeutic than a sort of static come to my office one day a week and do a 15 minute walk test on a treadmill. And so those tools, as those tools um, become more widespread, we do have a process underway right now to validate them as, as regulatory tools for purposes of of setting new approval standards based on these things, and we've seen that already happening. And I think that that's going to probably accelerate. Again, this takes a little bit of risk taking on the part of sponsors um, who have to do something different in the, front, in, in the face of a regulator who hasn't fully articulated what the standard would be and would ra sometimes, oftentimes, wants to be in a position to evaluate the information to establish that standard rather than have to do it a priori, because it's hard. Um, to do something before you've seen it. And so I think that both parties are going to need to make a little bit of a leap of faith here, um, including the, uh, the product development community. Thanks a lot.